All right, now we've discussed story. Let's write that down, story. And once we have story, we have engagement. So let's engage. And story doesn't have to be a big deal, but we've already worked stories out. And we've worked out that Perseus has been betrayed, and so has the Gorgon, and she's locked him up for revenge. And he is contemplating at the moment defeat. He's in the pits of despair, which is anticipation. So he's anticipating giving up, but we know he won't because he's a hero. Now on my screen here, I've brought up one of my favorite drawings using the rocky landscape idea. You can see how rugged all the pencil marks there are in here. And this is after days and days of drawing. So you might not get here until day 20 or something, but when you get there, you're gonna love it and enjoy it. And everything I'm teaching here will take you to that moment. Even if I don't reach that moment, it'll take you there eventually. So I'm gonna see if I can keep that in mind as I draw this and see if I can use a lot of this massing. If you can see here, there are a lot of mystery, especially there, look, a lot of mystery in that shadow. We could probably bring that in here. But on that note, the last thing we should think of is technique. The last thing is the style. So really there's three stages. There's the lay-in, so one, lay-in, two, journey person. That basically just means taking care of business. Person. And three, style is the last thing we should be thinking of. If you think of these in the wrong order, then you're doomed, okay? So the last thing I should be thinking about is this. The first thing I should be thinking of is how to lay this in. And if you don't know that term, it just basically means how to put those marks down as big, broad shapes. So let's do that. Welcome to New Masters Academy, the best place to get art education online. Master the skills of figure drawing, painting, sculpting, and much more with the guidance of world-renowned artists. Embark on your creative journey today at anime.art. So let's think of the story first of all. So Perseus betrayed, Perseus enslaved, Perseus enslaved. So that's anticipation. Anticipation of things to come. So let's lay them in with the mermaid's net. So we want to fit them on the page here. I should really do a preliminary for this, but I'm going to go in cold and see what we get. Because there comes a time if you get a little tired where you might use all your energy up on the preliminary, the preliminary, but generally it's the best thing to do, no matter where you are. But if the clock's running, and the clock is running for me, I'm going to go do it live and try and get all of that concentration in. So I'm bringing that arm around. Yeah, I put the mermaid's net in very fast. And a lot of that will give you energy. Look at the energy in this drawing already. It's all in there. Bring that leg up. This one here. And just finding that rhythm we've been chasing all day. Using all our mnemonics. That head high at the back there. The neck coming down to the seventh vertebrae. Pushing out for the scapula, pulling in for the scapula, pulling around for the spine, up for the tismus, tismus going around the back, and that leaves us this big bulge for the serratus going around the front. Let's bring the tube in.
So I'll get your setup right. Get yourself as comfortable as possible so that nothing's interfering with your thoughts. Your thoughts should be all on the page. No harm done. Find that gastrocnemius down to the malleolus, calcaneus. So you can see how things get faster as the day passes, unless you use your, if you lose all your strength up, that's not the case. But you should be able to get, think a little clearer after having done a few drawings. And that's mileage. And you want your mileage as close to your finished drawing as possible. Like I say, you never come in and start a finished drawing after a week off. Guaranteed to fail. Can't imagine or think of a time when it didn't. So find that head peak at the back. Big to small. Remember, keep your, your ideas clear. Going from big to small. I'm looking at small stuff here now, but I put the big stuff in first. So I'll make sure that you you adhere to those principles. You can see how the top of that little thing's well sharpened. Bring the ear back in space a little bit. Now it looks like the jaw's behind the neck there. Uh, the jaw is always in front of the ear. So what that is, is just fall off, it's just flesh. But remember, if you're going to do a square-jawed square hero, the jaw is before the ear. And if it wasn't, then the ear would move when you moved your jaw. Your ear would wiggle as you chewed, and that's not the case, so we know. Okay, there's the clavicle, and a nice big long push back there for the seventh vertebrae and art down to that spine. So that's feeling pretty nice. Long head of the tricep. And look how the arm wraps around, or the muscles wrap around the arm, like a towel from this position. And how do I know that? Well, you find the ulna. Let's come down a little lower for that. Remember, the ulna's on the lower arm, not the upper arm. Be careful. And there's that beautiful gesture of the of the flexors on the underside. And there's the common tendon. And so we have the long head of the tricep here. Short head just disappears under there. And to be honest, they look about the same length to me. That's the same with the biceps too. In fact, the long head of the biceps seems longer to me than the short head. But what it is, is the short, or the long head of the bicep goes way up onto the top of the scapula, a big string. So bizarrely, none of the biceps attach to the humerus at all. They're all going from the top down to the radius. And as the aponeurosa down to the ulna too. So this part here is basically the medius leaning on, just leaning on the epicondyle. It attaches onto the ulna. Tricky one that really does look like it attaches to the to the epicondyle. It's reserved for the flexors and the extensors. Thumb slow down for the hand. And I'm taking the hand out beyond the foot, beyond the leg, because it doesn't read too well. Gastrocnemius hiked up high. Big toe. Let's 
corner of the head. Move that ear back. It's kind of working on the fly a little bit here. Which you can do much easier with a charcoal tool than you can with a pencil. I'm going to mass all of this, I think. So even though I said don't think of, sh of style as you're drawing, you can think of it ahead of time. You know, I don't want to put it in yet, but I'm thinking of it. So you can do that. So it'll often sound like I'm contradicting myself. It's just that for every case, there's a different, there's a different set of boundaries that you want to consider, but none of them are rules. So basically every artwork has something to cons you have to consider. You might go totally against what you did last time to get there. And sometimes it's not a bad idea to completely reverse all of your, your ideas and see what happens. So I really want to feel that sweep around because that's really going to give us the despair. So you can see why I think that render hell is real because there's nothing more exciting than just laying it in because there's no render at all. You're just thinking about the adventure of making marks. And render's just basically going over those marks again. And there's a beauty in that too. There's a meditation to it. And that's okay on a, on a rainy day or a quiet day, but I'm all full of fire and vinegar here because I'm recording this and I'm talking to you guys. So that's a different story. So I'd rather just do all quick sketches. But I know you want to know how to course render. So we'll do some of it. Find the nose big biceps femoris and the obliques pressing. So we have on the male figure that's what the the obliques feel like rather than that curve of the female crest of the hips. Rather that we have this. So feeling that Feeling that scapula, pushing forward, and the terrace major giving us that shadow. That leaves us with the the pecs. So the big player on the male figure is the pecs. We're hardly seeing them at all, and that's fine with me. And once again, coming through that nipple will give you the serratus, which we're not seeing very clearly there. But the minute I do this, have a look on Rajiv. You can actually see them. This is different. These are the ribs and there's the twelfth. Once you see the last serratus, that's the ninth. That means the tenth is just underneath. So probably about there. Let's see, about there is the ninth, I think. And so that must be the tenth. And then this is eleventh and twelfth here. The eleventh and twelfth ribs are very thin. There's not much to them, so they're close together. So you don't do them as big as the other ribs. There's the obliques, and that means this is the medius, and this is the maximus. And the maximus has a compression to it, so feel that compression. And just like the female gluteus, we have a kind of squaring off before we come up, like that. So that needs a lot of volume to it. So we need to move this over too. That pentamento adjustment here. I've given it a very big gastrocnemius there, so let's bring it in a bit. And sometimes it's the negative space in here that'll tell you that. But please don't adhere to, to um, negative spaces if it's a, a rule that you have to always get exactly this shape that you see. That would be detrimental to your drawing. It's not important at all. Nobody cares what that left space is, negative space. Here call two things, left space or negative space, and none of it matters. Not for me, anyhow. You might be a purist, and you want photorealism, uh, but even then I don't think it matters. In fact, I think if you're a photorealist, what's going to make your work stand off from other people's work is by adhering to these principles. 
of changing things at your own will and making lines more gestural or more structural and still stay photographic and your work will look way different from everyone else's. Okay, so that's the lay-in. That's the time to just sit back for a second and look at what you've done and see what needs improved. You see how exciting a lay-in is? It goes in so fast. Feel the sweep of it. Get rid of any stuff on the side that's distracting. You might put him on a carpet or something. That's all he's got. His own, only comfort would be just a carpet. So if you don't want to know where to mess, you can just squint your eyes and see what disappears. And all of this is masked. Everything in here, everything in here. So if you look on the screen now, I have considered style ahead of time. Just squint into those shadows and see what it is you're not gonna you're not gonna put too much detail into. In here, like that. And this would be the time to step back from your work and assess if everything's good to go with render. All right, so once you step back from your artwork, what we say, uh, what we say, <laughs> we is the covent. What I think is, say you've got your lay-in, whatever time that takes, like say 10 minutes. So when I'm teaching a class, usually about 10 minutes for a student to lay in something. I say it's time to step back and assess. And sometimes your first decisions aren't actually the best decisions. So I thought, move that ear back. And now, in retrospect, I'm going to bring it back in again. So I'm going to push this head forward, because what happened is the head has lost its downward despair. despair. The despair in this character is no longer evident because of that head coming back. So that's the first call. Second call is I feel that, that this length here is too long. So I'm just going to quickly bring that Alecranon down to here. And I automatically feel much better about that. Bring this ear a little closer. But more is the back of that head. That's what really makes the difference. I want this head to fall forward more. And even more so about here. So the head feels a bit big as well. So that, that's what I'm after there. And that eye a little bit more forward. So all of those things are making a big difference. And this leg, these two binary shapes here, this has fallen into mass in any way, near enough, so we don't have to worry too much about that adjustment. Somewhere along there, and that foot is coming forward of this foot. Like that. Somewhere along there. So, tiny little changes, big differences. And I think that's much better now. Those small little things. So that's the fresh eye. So when you do your lay-in, what you have to do, what you should do, is take that and make that a 1B. And say that this is now adjustments. And then off you go as the journey person to start hacking away at this until it gets better and better. So everything should be an improvement. And I'm going to go in here and start improving now. Let's have a look at this length of this deltoid. I want that deltoid to be a bit longer in here. That neck. The peak. The peak's coming back from the eyes, so it needs to be down a little bit here. That feels right. And maybe he has longer hair. I think that's what it needs. It's a bit, little bit of that despair that comes with longer hair falling down. Yeah, somewhere like that. So there's little adjustments all the way across. 
and this is mass in two. There's going to be a lot of mass in, in this. We basically take the detail on it. Now, this big stuff, big to small, so I want this deltoid to have a straight on it. It's a bit too big. Come back in. One side to the other. What's the other side doing? Long head of the tricep coming in to attach onto this lower now. Lower moment. Medial epicondyle. Sorry, lateral. It's on the outside. Medial on the inside. Medial tricep falling down onto that medial epicondyle. So medial means middle, remember that. And now we've got compression here as well of those flexors underneath. And up to the big player here that overlaps, brachioridialis. I'm sure you're getting used to that name now. And at the very start, that would have seemed so alien, and yet now you know it so well. Coming over for what would really be the brachialis, but for most of the world, that's just the biceps hump. But it is the brachialis. And that is the biceps on that side. Brachial radialis from a different point of view. That's going to be masked, so you can just let that mass there if it makes you feel better about how much work is to come. There's less than you think. See, and we're going to drop a big drop shadow here. Cross. And the needling point. So knowing all this stuff means that you can do less work because the silhouette shapes are doing a lot of the work for you. It doesn't say I don't love doing the work because it's not work to me at all. But I like the idea that you all your mileage means you can do a, a drawing that looks like a lot of work when it's not really. Come down to that calcaneus. Rectus femoris on top. And feel the tension. Note the word of that tensor, fascia latte, which is a really big player on Rajiv. The obliques compressing. Feel a little bit of the skin suit going all the way around and feel that moment of the back pushing in and then the gluteus medius and then the maximus which is usually the bigger player but because it's being compressed here less so and then pushing up for these gluteus maximus there's where we see how big the maximus is we're seeing it all the way under here and once again on the other side, here. And I can look now on the screen here and say, well, I'm starting to think about the style in here and how much of this I can get. And look how beautiful just big masses can be as long as they are correct. So that tarsal mass there. Let's see if we can find some weight to this tricep. So feel the gravity. So don't forget gravity. So adjustments, gravity, and compression. There are two things that may not be evident when you're laying in because you're not feeling the weight of anything. You're just looking at structures. So I want to feel, you know, even the weight of that gastrocnemius there, for instance. You know, it's all pulling down. All of it weighs something. And one side to the other will always make your life easier. What's the other side doing? This is all going to be masked, so I don't have to, to think beyond here. And that'll create atmosphere as well. Maybe I'll give them all long hair. Maybe Perseus has long hair. It makes more sense anyway. So let's do that just to begin with. And let's feel, once again, another pinch here of the skin. 
where the the major muscle is. Here we have the scapula and the acromion process plus on top there clavicle. Let's feel a little bit of the trapezius pushing over is a hump here before we get to the bone of the scapula coming down to that terrace major pushing out from underneath. And so we'll get lots of little soft shadows in here. You can see a little bit of the terrace major meeting up with the infraspinatus, which takes up most of the scapula, along with, of course, the biggest player of all, the deltoid. It's a soft form. So I've done a very big deltoid here, but I don't mind it at all. Let's find the wrinkles of the rhythm created by the sternocleidomastoid against the trapezius. And I am thinking a little bit of style here. I'm thinking about how thin a line can I get here for this spine going down the back and contrasting it with this thicker line. So whatever's coming underneath, like take the latissimus. Now this latissimus is going all the way around the back to attach above the sacrum. So it's a big sweep. It's a big cape. Just think of that. Think of a cape. And it's cast in a shadow. Look how thick it is at that point. And it's so thick there. And the reason for that is these serratus underneath are coming down like this and around as a group. And so they, underneath this cape, create a big bulge on that side. And then we have, of course, the ribs themselves and this that shape we saw earlier, the intercostals. So we have all the massing in there. And this is a case where we see we're going to have some very dark darks in there. This is that moment when that beautiful tensor fascia latte breaks as it turns the corner. Here we have a bit of coarse shadow for the gastrocnemius. You can really lean into that pencil now. And feel your pencil to see how brave it is to see if it's going to break. This doesn't feel like it's going to break, even though, oh, it's a medium, that's why. It's not a soft. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And that's the digitorum brevis, brevis so it's a little softer than this calcaneus. None of that really matters. This is where we get the tendons pulling on each side of that. Now we see in the tertius, we're not. The tertius tells us halfway. Put a straight on a curve. A drop shadow. See some angst in here. I don't want to put too much detail in there, practically none. I really want that to mass in. Just enough to show a face. Let's get some broad, some broad shapes in here now. And some echoes as well, some reverberations of these muscle masses.
from straights on curves. Carpy, carpy, carpy extensors above. Carpy flexors underneath. The thumb, that hitchhiker thumb comes up as a block. Got the web in here. And those knuckles as a box shape, so become a box shape like this. And then each one of them pushes out as its own box and around, pushes out as its own box and around like this. And then the last one, just a little bit different from the others, push knot a little bit more, and maybe like that. I like to have a little maverick on each side. Like I say, we've changed these around a little bit so that they're a little bit more dramatic. It is strange, this forearm in its shape. So if we keep it rocky, we should be okay. But it does look weird to me. So I think Perseus needs something exotic. I think he needs an earring in there. Just block it in to start with. And because it's old worldy, you can do that. It doesn't look weird. As long as we have plenty of... Don't want it to be a new romantic either, so be careful. Got to worry about that hair there. Now it's in my mind, I can't get it out. So I'll have to watch that. Okay, want to drop shadow under here, even if we don't see it. Make one up and see how that arm comes away from the body just in that idea. Remember, we want to go hard for shadows that are near bones. And this is massing in here. You can mass too much, but the idea of this drawing is how to mass and make mystery. And also how to use a rocky landscape to, to feel that classic sort of retro manliness. We feel the turn around of that biceps femoris made in the gluteus maximus. So you're blending and drawing at the same time. And don't forget to learn to love the pencil. Re-love the pencil. Let's feel that tension here. The common tendon. And that reverberation of muscle mass on the way down the forearm. So this is in darkness, this is in light. Let's differentiate a little bit with that deltoid there. And here. Don't want it to look too mechanical. Break it up in the middle.
But don't forget this rocky landscape we're trying to get. So like I say, we get a broad pull down from here, from the top of the ear down to the, the mouth generally, it's corners of the mouth. And then that splay out for the neck. So we can be more audacious with our lines and less worried about them. Because they'll always look good as long as they're bold. So now I can do a Michelangelo on this and carve into it. And also want it to soften right off up here. To feel the gloom of that chamber that he's in. So basically what we've created here is a clay shape that we can now cut into with, with an eraser. And really muddy it up. This is the time to be bold. Find rhythms where you can. When things seem too snake-like, like they are there, then rocky them up, making new verbs up. I can go in here now and push, feel that flesh. On her misty dust all over the place. He's constantly in, enveloped in her her scent. So he's intoxicated by it. Can't quite work out what's wrong with him. Why he's in this constant funk. She never leaves. She's always there. So we can get fleshiness by just sculpting in and then just touch in into the form. But always be drawing, never, never be haphazard with this. It has to be the corner of something, for instance. It has to be the edge of something, like that long head of the tricep. It has to be a fibrous change in flexors or extensors. It has to be the top flat part there of the digitorum, for instance. It all has to make sense. Put a shadow from that thumb across that hand. Once again, you don't want to delineate everything. But the fingers and hands only ever really start to come together when you put a little bit of detail in them. 
like that point there where the creases happen. If you look at uh, the likes of comic book artists like Jack Davis, he could really draw hands, but he did them cartoony. But he's a great artist to look at, to see how he took these fingers and made them understandable by just working on those bone shapes. He was really terrific at it, really brilliant. So I've changed that thumb a little bit because I wanted to, to move along that hand, that arm. So always a big call when you change a, a hand, especially since they're so difficult to begin with. You'd be scared of them, but you know, what, what damage can you do? Once again, it's just a drawing. It's probably the best time to do it when you're in the shadows. No harm, no foul, they say. And people will admire your work if you're brave. You know, if I do that, for instance, for a knee, it's an interesting thing. If I go wrong like this, it has a Jack Davis quality to it, actually. You could do a lot of reverberation. So I shot up for Jack Davis. He, he never had a proper retrospective of his work in, in book form. It's always a shame, the greatest artist of all time, in comic books for sure. And almost looks like he's going to be forgotten, and that would be a, an absolute crime. So I'm feeling the broad, broad end of this. So what I tend to do is, is basically avoid getting into the next medium for as long as possible, like I avoided getting into the pencil for as long as I could when I was in the charcoal. I'm avoiding getting into the pit charcoal now for as long as I can. Just feeling the reverberations there of pencil strokes rather than how the muscles would work. And sometimes that's what you do. You say, this is a drawing. I'm not actually following anything other than rhythm. And remember, you're the boss. You can do anything you want. So do it. Be the boss. Everyone loves to be the boss. You think you won't be, but you will. You'll love it. Get in there. Treat yourself to the world of the boss. If you want to see what a boss sounds like, just check out William Shatner being art directed by a kid for a radio show. And it is hilarious, cruel, but necessary as a learning, learning tool. And a lesson in how not to be bullied as well. Check that out. It's funny. It's funny as hell. Nobody bullies William Shatner. Sometimes get a little wild with your lines and show that once again that you're the boss. You know, I'll look back now on my little successful drawing here and ask myself why was it successful well it's bold isn't it it's it's got loads of sort of what you would call in charcoal loose brushwork 
has little moments like this carved into it. Little moments where the muscle meets another muscle and gets carved into. It's also good for getting skin like that. Just be bold inside the shapes. Carve in the, the ribs. Go to the edge of one form and pull it out. This is, this is chiaroscuro now. Extreme light against dark. Feel that rhythm of form turning. So imagine that it is a suit of skin. You know, you've heard me say that term a lot, but just imagine it. It's skin. It has to wrinkle around these bony moments. It gets thinner like that against bone. Carve into that terrace major, the big player on the lower end of the scapula, coming around to go underneath the arm. Is there any muscle you want to really look at in depth? Go on and have a look at that terrace major, and then you'll understand why it's Ray Bustos' favorite muscle. I mean, how can you have a favorite muscle? Well, you can. There's my favorite muscle right there, long head of the tricep, because it takes me nicely down to that epicondyle and ulna. So it's a lovely bridge landmark for me to always be on top of things. Find that brachialis tricep moment. And you see how fleshy that's becoming and how realistic. And it's really just an indication rather than reality. So you'll enjoy this. You'll enjoy the kneadable eraser. This is basically the kneadable eraser's moment in the sun. Be a sculptor. Feel the fleshiness of that. So if you laid a lot of paint down in oils, you could use a rag like this, which I often do. I paint with rags. It's amazing how much stuff you can get out of just a rag really is incredible. It frees you right up, gets you out of the world that a paintbrush is the law. A paintbrush was just a tool to lay paint on. You can lay it down with your hands if you like. Not advisable with all the toxins that are in paint. <laughs>